number four. It was a school day about two years ago, the day before my birthday. My two best friends and I were on our way to lunch. I should also mention that the house where we have lunch is a 10 minute walk from our school. We were heading back to our school when we noticed a car with dark windows following us. We stopped and the car also stopped and rolled down his car window and said, Hey, do you know where the way to the city is? One of my more confident friends started telling him and asked him if he knew the way to another part of the city and he said, Yes, but I don't want to go there. I want to go to the city. My friends thought that was really weird since if he knew the way there, you basically know the way to the city. At this point, I started to get annoyed since he was taking so long and so I started to look around. Also, I'm about a foot taller than my friends, so I had a better view into his car. After about a minute, I noticed that one of his hands wasn't on the steering wheel, so I followed his arm down to where his hands were. And you guessed it. He was jerking off to us, obviously underage girls outside of a school. I tried to tell my friends that our class starts soon as a desperate try to get them out of the situation. Of course, they didn't hear me at all. But eventually, they were done talking to the guy and he started to really slowly drive away. And then he stopped again. We had no choice but to walk past him again. He rolled down his window once again and this time he said, Thanks for the help, and by the way... You guys are really hot. Then he rolled up his window and drove away really fast. We didn't say a word and more or less ran back to our school and told the teachers and it got reported to the police. Now to the creepy part. One month later, I read in the news that a couple of young girls had been dragged into a similar car and they never returned. No one knows what happened to them. The scariest thing to think about is that what would have happened to me if I walked from lunch alone that day? Number 3 I was performing stand-up like usual in this dive bar in the outskirts of my city just to escape from my brother's house for the night. I have run into bad nights in other clubs like all comics do, but this one was by far the worst. I do amateur comedy still in these kinds of clubs. These bars have the worst of the worst, drunk fiends who escape their pregnant wives and beat their children, people who will never shut up at the expense of the people on stage, and of course, the hecklers. However, this particular heckler was weird. It started off me doing a joke about religion, and this man just let out a, Ooh. This man replied, How about I kill you? Everyone was in shock, and I said, How about no? and everyone laughed. This man was laughing maniacally and said, You're dead. I said as a joke, Well fuck you. And everyone laughed. Then I proceeded with my five minutes. I went out of the bar feeling good about the set, and guess who walked out at the same time as I did? It was him. Now, this feeling I got was unnerving. Have you ever had a sharp pain in your heart that sets in with a feeling of endangerment? That happened to me. Now, hecklers usually are non-threatening and they leave you alone. But this man, he was relentless. I was walking to my car and the man shoved me into a car in the alleyway. He said to me, You wanna fuck with me again? I looked at his crazed eyes and that was strangely and scarily the only thing that was shown on his face from the dark alley. And they were bloodshot. He later whispered, You don't like God? I love God. And he loves me. You better go to church. He later proceeded to get out his knife. I didn't cry for help because thinking like a badass, I had the I'm not afraid of dying mentality. But he didn't use it. He just threatened to carve my cheek. And then he danced away. Turns out he was alone in the club that night. And no other man dared to attack the heckler back. That's what made me the center of his attack. I hope I never see this guy again. Number 2 I commute to university four days of the week. As a family girl who likes her comforts, I preferred commuting on the local train for my first year. It was only 20 minutes away anyway. For the first month or two, it was alright. My anxiety was muted, but still present enough. It reached sky high when I went into a busy train one early morning though. 
Seeing no seats, I begrudgingly leant on the railings trying to push down the paranoia of three people also on the rails leaning so close to me. Perhaps it's my paranoia that caught up on the weird vibe around me, or it might be the feeling of a presence behind me or something. I stood ridged as I felt hot breath on my head from this solid force behind me, as if something was smelling me. Startled, I flicked my head back quickly, fast enough to catch the person in the act. A tall, bulky man in grubby clothes and a brown jacket was staring back at me, or rather, down at me. I'm only 5'6", this guy had a good few feet on me. He had a face worn by time and thick black facial hair. His eyes widened and he put on a timid, childlike smile. I, I love your lanyard, he stuttered in a high-pitched voice. I glanced down at my Batman lanyard and uni student card and then awkwardly grinned. I thanked him and turned to look out the window again. I called off my suspicion of his fascination though. It seems that teenage girls liking Marvel and DC is a rare sight to some blokes. But I froze when it clicked that my hair was down and my back was to him. There was no way he could have seen it before I turned around. This guy was actually smelling me. But I couldn't move in this busy carriage though, and me acknowledging his presence, it seemed to be the go-ahead that I was his new best friend and he constantly talked to me in fractured sentences. Despite myself, I relaxed. This guy clearly has mental issues and has a childlike mind. I saw the man's carer nearby and a false sense of security washed over me. The stops were flying by, but more people got on if anything. And this man seemed to get closer to me, occasionally playing with my lanyard and hair or pressing against me slightly for support. I felt I had to ignore him and humoured him as this guy was a gentle giant despite his appearance. He reminded me of a character from the Book of Mice and Men. I didn't tell him that this was my stop as I said goodbye briskly and moved to the door, but he tried to hold me to keep me from coming off. But the man's caregiver pulled him away, shaking his head with a serious expression on his face. Then he looked at me and smiled awkwardly. I hastily left the train and tried to ignore my racing heart and put it to the back of my mind, continuing my day. This encounter doesn't seem scary, but it's what I learnt two months later from a few other commuters which sent shivers down my spine. A man and his friend were arrested. They posed as a caregiver and mentally unstable man to talk to girls and occasionally young boys. The act made people let their guard down and gave this fucker the excuse to push boundaries in talking and physical contact and play it off as his illness. They were caught in their routine of luring a victim by asking for help until they reached a secluded area. In this case, the men's bathroom. A concerned commuter heard what sounded like a fight and alerted the staff. The two were restrained and cuffed as soon as the police were on the scene. These guys were arrested for sexual assault of seven people, which consisted of women or little boys. They would do this in public places because they later admitted they got a kick out of it and would film it for some quick cash. So yeah, I was approached and targeted by a predator and his sick friend, and I got away because they got off at a different stop to me, and I left the train with no warning either. I hate to imagine if I did tell them or if I was slower what they would have done. I still cringe at the thought of the feeling of that hot breath on the back of my head. Number 1 This is the scariest thing, by far, that's ever happened to me. I live in a fairly peaceful and safe area. Nothing really bad or dramatic happens around here. I'm not like most people my age. Most people my age go out drinking, smoking, doing drugs all night, every night, but I'm not really about that. My friends and I are more of the outcasts of the social ladder. There's three of us, me and my two best friends, and for a while now, we've gone out exploring. We would go out into abandoned buildings and all sorts of derelict areas which were cool to explore. We did this all the time. It became a huge hobby of ours. We explored old factories, warehouses, supposed haunted houses. It was awesome. We had explored the majority of buildings and areas we could around our town. We started exploring deep into the forests and nature which surround us. The furthest we had ever gone was to an old abandoned house about a 45 minute walk into the forest. One Friday night, when there was a massive party on, 
Of course, we weren't invited. We didn't want to spend Friday night inside playing Dota 2 as usual, so we decided to go out. We'd been talking to some friends who had heard rumours about an old bunker far away from here. We knew this was going to be the place we should go. So we got dressed and packed our bags. We made the mistake of not telling anyone where we were going, and this could have cost us our lives. We got on the normal bus and had been on it for about an hour until it dropped us in a remote petrol station. This was where we usually entered the forest. We took the normal route into the forest and must have spent around an hour just walking, and by this time it was getting really cold and dark. We wanted to turn back, but we had come so far, and it was supposedly really close to where we were. Another 15 minutes of walking, and bear in mind, we didn't have the slightest idea of where we were and what was around here. Things were getting freaky, but our teenage minds thought it would be cool to carry on. We didn't have any food or water. We had packed a little bit of Coca-Cola, but that was long gone. Around five minutes away, where the bunker was meant to be, I felt a presence, like there was someone near, watching me. It was a weird feeling, almost like a sixth sense or something. It creeped me out, but I thought nothing of it. Finally, we reached the fence in which the bunker was behind. As it was on a private property, it was all fenced off. We climbed over this fence. This was quite hard and took around 5 minutes as the fence was really tall. The fence had this really weird wobble, and every time you put pressure on a certain part, the whole pole on the side would tilt to the side and then ping back once the pressure was off. When we were over the fence, and about 10 meters away from it, I looked back at the fence for some reason, and saw this pole. It was in the position as if someone was putting pressure on it. It then quickly pinged back to its normal position. This freaked me out, but I persuaded myself it was just the wind or something. We finally found the bunker. It was just a concrete hole in the ground. We lifted up the lid, and made sure that there was no way it could fall down. We propped it back with a spade we had found nearby and a couple of logs, and we climbed in. The ladder was rusty and cold and creaked loudly every time we climbed down a run. We all reached the bottom. The ground was soaking wet and the walls were deteriorating. Nothing more than you would expect from an abandoned place. It was pretty dark, so we used the torch in our phones to light it up. To our surprise, it looked like someone was living down there. There was an old metal bed, a cabinet with a water bottle and food wrappers on. There were a pair of shoes on the floor and a bedside cabinet. We opened the cabinet to find, not a word of a lie, some empty bullet shells and a crumpled picture of a teenage boy. Freaked out, we decided to leave. We looked at the wall to see chalking of tallies, like prisoners count how many days they'd been in prison for. There were hundreds of these markings, along with words, written very scruffy and unreadable. As we were trying to make out these words, we heard a loud crash, which made us all have a heart attack. As we looked, it was the logs and the space which were propping up the lid. They had fallen down into the bunker. I said to my friends, What the fuck? And then the expected happened. The bunker lid slammed shut, making a deafening crash. We all started to absolutely freak out. We started panicking and swearing. We were about to try the lid when we heard a creak. The exact same creak of which we heard when we were climbing down the ladder. Someone else was climbing down into here with us. The way the ladder was positioned, you couldn't see the ladder unless you were right at the bottom. My friend picked up the scrap wood on the floor and held it like a baseball bat. I prepared myself for the worst, absolutely shaking and trembling with fear. We had no idea what was going to happen. We counted the creaks as they came, and this person must have been near the bottom, when the creaking just stopped. We stood there, frozen, for about two minutes before we decided to look. We slowly crept over to the ladder, and we prepared ourselves to look. We turned the corner and saw the ladder. It was completely fucking empty. Once again I said, What the fuck is going on? We knew we had to leave. My friend went first up the ladder, only to find what we had all feared. The lid wouldn't budge. We all pushed together as hard as we could, and it wouldn't move. It had been locked or weighed down or something, but it was shut. We climbed back down and feared the worst. My friend started going on about how we were going to die down here, how no one would find us. We tried to call someone, 
but being in the middle of the forest and down a hole, we didn't have any signal. A total of three and a half hours passed of us just being shut down there. In this time, we panicked. One of my friends cried, and we were all falling apart. We had heard various bangs and creaks while we were down there. Another four hours passed. We had no food or water, and we were hungry, thirsty, and scared. But somehow, we all managed to get some sleep. We propped up against each other on the bed. I had no idea how we fell asleep. It was the last thing we wanted to do, or thought we would do, but we did. And when we woke up, there was light. There was daylight flooding in through the bunker. The lid had been opened. Instantly, we woke each other up and quickly climbed out. We observed the top of the bunker, and we could see that there was no lock or weight or anything nearby. We had no idea what or who locked us down there. It took us over two hours to find our way back to the road. We quickly phoned our parents and explained everything. We've never gone back and don't intend to. My advice, if you go exploring, tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. So if you're not, they know where to find you. Our parents had called the police and been out all night as it wasn't like us to not come home. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video guys. Thanks again to the Hive members that bravely shared their stories for us all to hear. And for the chance to have your story feature in a video, you can send your story to my email which is in the description below. And be sure to keep them coming guys, as this channel relies upon your stories to continue. Also guys, please do me a little favour and just state in your email what your story is about in the description and also provide me with a short written statement of consent just so that I can be above board with everything. And also remember to tell me in the email if you would like to remain anonymous and please also change any names if you don't want particular names to be shared. Uh, it would be awesome if you could like, share, comment and subscribe if you're new. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for updates throughout the week. Thanks again for tuning in guys, and as always, I'll see you mates in the next one.